open your Bibles with me to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16, and we'll continue with our theme of this conference. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16, and when you have it, just say amen, and then we'll read it all together. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. The Word of God is read in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Bible says, In all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Amen? I want to continue with the conference, These Stones Cry Out, and if you were here with us in the last two days, we talked about the importance of a lot of these archaeological findings that we have around us that help us to reaffirm our faith in the Bible. And we're not going to show any presentations at this moment. We're just going to preach a message today. And what we learned in these past two days is that what we have in front of us as the Scriptures or the Bible is truth. How many of you believe that? Everything that is written in it is truth. The Scriptures is truth. And today, out of all the years that, we have, that mankind has been here on earth, I think the attack has begun to be even stronger against uh, the veracity of the Word of God and how truth the Scriptures are. And I wanted to go straight into the Bible, and I thought about, uh, as I began to formulate this message of the implications that many of us uh, will face, and many of our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world at this moment are facing persecution for their mere belief in the Scriptures. Because they have decided that by faith they believe that everything that is written in the Word of God or in the Bible is truth. And because of this, they are suffering implications today. Persecution. Many of them are in jails. Many of them worship in secret churches in, in, in Korea, North Korea, and many of these places. And you and I are in a country today that at for this moment, we have the freedom to have the Word of God in front of us. And I say at this moment, because it can change drastically. Things are developing today behind the scenes that we don't know what will happen tomorrow. We might as well grab a hold of the Word of God and believe that what we have in front of us is the inspired Word of God. How many of you have your Bibles? Raise your Bibles up if you have them with you. If you have that app on your phone, raise your phone up with that app on there. Huh? Nowadays, we're in church and we say, open your Bibles and turn them on. <laughs> but it is the same inspired word. And I want to talk about a man that many of us have read about by the name of the Apostle Paul. And Paul writes to Timothy, and in 2 Timothy, I'm going to read it one more time, Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, all Scripture is given by inspiration of who? Of God. And then he tells him it's not only given by inspiration, but it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I want to give you some background to what's going on when Paul is writing this letter to Timothy. In this letter to Timothy, Paul writes from his second imprisonment. He's in prison for the second time in all his ministry. But this time, this second imprisonment is not like the first. Paul finds himself in a situation that he knew he would not leave from that place. You see, during his first imprisonment, Paul was granted the privilege of being under house arrest while continuing his ministry. However, this time around, roughly five to six years later, Paul is arrested again, and now he finds himself, as he's writing to Timothy, in a confined cell, a cold cell, 
no electricity, nothing around him, no lights, bound in chains, facing no possible release from this imprisonment, and adding to his misery, Paul not only is confronted with pending execution, but he has also been abandoned by the members of the church. Listen to this. This is Paul's situation at that moment. It's his second imprisonment. He sees this all around him. And the church, or many of the members, because of the persecution that had come upon the church, had abandoned Paul. And in all of this, Paul finds within him to still write to Timothy and say, but you know what, Timothy? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Chapter 4 and verse 9, he tells Timothy, do your best to come soon. I'm giving you some background here. So he's writing to Timothy. He's in this cell. He's completely abandoned. Everybody has abandoned him. And he's writing to Timothy and he says, Timothy, I want you to come and visit me here in Rome. In verse 21, he says, do your best to come before winter. But history tells us that it's uncertain that it is possible that Timothy was never able to visit Paul before his, before his execution. It is, believed to have, it is believed that Paul was put to death there in Rome and never released from his second imprisonment. But can you just hear the words? As Paul says in chapter 4 and verse 6, Paul says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I want you to understand clearly the background to what we have here when, we re when we're reading Timothy. What is going on with Paul? Why is Paul telling Timothy in this situation that he finds himself that everything that he's preached has been inspired by God? Even in the midst of his situation, he still found hope in the Scriptures. And even in that situation, he was trying to impart that same hope to Timothy. And he tells him, I know that I'm being used by the Roman Empire as a scapegoat. I know that they're going to use me as an example to kill me so that you guys can be persecuted and scared. I know that everybody else has abandoned me here in this place. But still, God's Word is inspired. In the midst of facing death, Paul had an assurance of what he had believed in and what he had given his life and his ministry to. Paul was assured that what he preached was real. Paul was assured of this. He desired for Timothy and those that would read his letter, you and I today that are present, would be assured that we too would share in this assurance that all Scripture is inspired by God. It is inerrant. There is no errors in the Word of God. And there's implications today that you and I are going to face and people are facing today for believing in biblical inerrancy. What does that mean? What does that mean today? Paul exhorts Timothy in chapter 1 and verse 6. He says, fan into flame the gift of God, he tells him. Which was where, he says, that gift of God that is in you. He was telling him, fan him. In verse 13 and 14, he admonishes him to hold on to sound doctrine. Listen to Paul. Where is he getting this inspiration from? In the situation that he finds himself. 
in prison, abandoned, cold in a cell, and still he is telling Timothy, I don't care what I'm going through. I want you to hold on to the Word of God. Listen to that. He's telling him, fan into the flame the gift of God. Hold on to sound doctrine. In chapter 2, he says, avoid error and present yourself approved unto God. Hallelujah. Listen to Timothy. Listen to what he's listening to. Imagine Timothy open up that scripture, or open up that letter as he begins to read. And, he, and, and, and Paul begins to speak to him through his words. And Timothy begins to be reminded to fan to, into the flame. In other words, a stir up the gift of God that was in him already. And he begins to read. And he says, not just that, but as you begin to stir it up, I want you to hold fast to sound doctrine. Don't let go of the inspired word. And then he says, and as you do that, you're going to be approved unto God. But he don't stop there. Paul doesn't stop there. He continues and he tells him, endure persecution. If there was anybody that could tell Timothy about persecution, it was Paul. It was Paul. What would you do in that situation? You've given all your life to the ministry. You've been through all these shipwrecks. You've been through all these situations. You've lost out with all your friends. And those that you thought were members of the body of Christ that were friends of yours have at that moment completely abandoned you. What would you do? I don't know what I would do. I'd probably I'd be down in the dumps. I probably want to give up at that moment. The enemy will be probably trying to play games with your mind and say, well, it wasn't worth it. Was it worth everything you went through, Paul? But there was something in Paul that you and I can receive today also. Amen. That he tells him, endure persecution. But then he tells him in chapter 3, to put his full confidence in the scriptures. Listen to what he says. He tells them, fan into flame the gift of God in chapter 1. In verse 13 and 14, he says, hold on to sound doctrine. In chapter 2, he says, avoid error and present himself approved to God. In chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, he says, endure persecution. And then in chapter 3, in verse 15 and 16, he says, put your full confidence in the scriptures and preach without any fear of the implications that you will face. Listen to that. Because he believed in the inerrancy of the word of God, that it was without error. If you were with us in these two days, you'd find out that the Bible is not only without error, but it is accurate historically, culturally, traditionally. It is accurate in everything that we have today. And things outside of the scriptures prove to us to reaffirm our faith that what you and I have in front of us is truth and without error. Now, I wonder where Paul found his boldness. I wonder where he found his confidence. I wonder where Paul found his courage to impart such teachings to Timothy. Given in his dire circumstances, as we, as we mentioned, being in a cold cell, facing a forthcoming death, what would you do knowing that they were going to kill you soon? What would you do? There's a story of... One of the founders of the Voice of the Martyrs, if you know that ministry, it's a great ministry. And he talks about the time of the socialists in Russia and how many of our brothers and sisters in Christ were being persecuted and they were being taken into jails. And there was a sad situation where a father and his son are put into jail for their belief in the Bible and in the Scriptures and in Jesus. And the soldiers come out and they take them both out and they line them up with a gun and they tell the son, deny Jesus 
and we won't kill your father. And the little boy looks at his dad and the dad says, do not deny Jesus. What would you do in that situation? This is truth. And the little boy dies because he would not deny Jesus. Paul has found himself in certain death. Paul finds himself with this, deserted by many, and the enemy must have tried to play with his mind. Of course. Paul was human just like you and I. The enemy must have made him feel that he was isolated and alone. How many of you have been through that? Amen? Perhaps he even questioned whether all the suffering he had endured throughout the years was worth it. Is it possible that he thought about the time spent preaching and teaching people who then would abandon him in this tough situation? Paul's response cannot be explained through mere human understanding of suffering. You cannot explain what he was feeling. Without God, anyone in such conditions would have given up completely. However, Paul was guided by the Holy Ghost. He had faith in whom he had placed his trust in. He recognized the truth of the Scriptures. And he accepted that he would face negative consequences for his belief in the inerrancy of the Scriptures. Yet despite these challenges, Paul remained steadfast in his faith. Yet despite these challenges, God granted him boldness and courage to stand firm in the belief of the Scriptures. Now let's go back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The reason why Paul was so invested in helping Timothy may remain a mystery for us. But we can draw some conclusion. One possibility is that Timothy was confronting false teachings that had crept into the church. Ideas and human traditions that had threatened to infiltrate the church. And Paul understood that Timothy needed to remain steadfast in the Word of God. You don't get what you need from God just on Sundays. You need to get what you need from God every single day. If you're alone and single and not married, get into the Scriptures every day. And if you have a family, have family devotionals every single day. Don't miss out on your devotionals. We say, I don't know what to do in devotion. Read the Bible. That's it. Read it to your children. One of the false teachings that Timothy faced, which continues to be a topic of debate today, is that the Bible is not truth. That what we have here, these manuscripts that we have used for the translation of the Bible, are, are errors, and there's been a bunch of errors, so what we have in front of us is not the truth of the Scriptures. But what does the word inerrancy mean? It means, and it refers to the belief that the Bible and its original manuscripts are without error, without fault in its teachings, in its theological understanding, in the morality and the historical manners. It's all accurate. Unbelievable. Advocates of the biblical inerrancy believe that the Bible, and how many of you believe that the Bible is inspired? It has no errors. And it is the authoritative word of God for the church. Amen? This doctrine is often associated, and I looked this up and listen to it. It said it's associated with conservative Protestant Christianity. So in other words, not all Christians believe that the Bible is truth. Some believe in the Bible, but they say, well, I believe it, but it has a few errors. Not us. Let it never be said of us. To proclaim or, or to make such a statement that we believe in the Bible, but that it has a few errors. No, the Bible has no errors in it. It is accurate. It has been preserved by God. It has been inspired by God. 
Amen? What was Paul's message to Timothy? Simply put, Paul was telling Timothy that what he had learned from his mother and grandmother, how many of you had tough mothers and grandmothers? Hmm? What, he had been, what he had learned from them, he had to continue in it. Now, all Scripture is inspired, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Let's, let's break this down real quick. Do I have a, a few hours left? Okay. All Scripture is inspired by God. What does he mean when he says all Scripture? This phrase all Scripture in the Greek is pasagraph. So he's saying pasagraph is inspired. In other words, it's translated into not just all, every single Scripture, comma, Period. Every single thing in the Bible is inspired by God. Every single thing. Paul used this phrase to refer at his time to the Old Testament, which were the only scriptures available during his lifetime. But later, when the New Testament books were written and were compiled together, they were also included under Pasagrapha. In other words, they were included under the inspired word of God. Now, certain individuals will say, well, Paul was talking about the Old Testament, so that means that we don't have to accept the New Testament. But there is an argument here that can be rebutted real quick. Because Peter tells us in 2 Timothy, in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, he referred Peter, and I'm going to say it here, and I'm going to paraphrase what he said. Peter said there are things that Paul has written that I don't even understand. Listen to it. And by the time that Peter is writing his letter, Paul's letters were already being considered inspired, authoritative word of God. So in other words, that quickly tells us that the Old and the New Testament are inspired by God. Now, gradually over time, the books that were recognized and inspired give us what we have today known as the Old and New Testament. And the process of recognizing this was not uniformed in the Christian church for many years, but today has been widely accepted that what we have in front of us is the inspired Word of God. We can go into a lot of history, but I'm, we're not going to go into there. Well, that'll give us the opportunity to come back. Paul says all scripture, then he says, is given by inspiration. In Greek, all those words are put together in one. Remember, we talked about the Greek language is just like the Spanish language. In, in Spanish, if you don't know how to say something, you just make it up. In Greek, it was the same way. You didn't know how to say something, you just make it up. So what Paul did was that he put these two words together, and we got this whole sentence in English, is given by inspiration of God. And Paul is saying here, in other words, the literal translation is, it is that it is breathed out by God. So when Paul is talking, he's saying all scripture is breathed out by God. This is very important here. Because when Paul is writing here, he puts two words together, theos and no, which means breathed out by God. So as Paul is saying, all scripture is inspired, it is given, it is breathed out by God. And in other occasions, God would speak to the prophets like Jeremiah 1.9 says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And you remember Jeremiah, a prophet of God that was used by God. And God would say, Jeremiah, go tell the people this and that. And at the beginning, it was real good for Jeremiah because the people would clap. Oh, that's great. They said, thank you for bringing us the word of God. But then when judgment came, it came to a point where God tells Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I want you to go tell them. And he said, I'm not going. And an old preacher said, he said, I can imagine God looking at him and saying, what is wrong with this little man? What is wrong with him? You're going to do what I tell you to do. Because it was what? Given by God. Now Paul here is implying that not only was the scripture given to us by God, but in a sense it was breathed out by God. In other words, God has given us something that has life. 
I want you to understand this. Paul uses the Greek term, bro. So in other words, if we were to read what Paul is saying, he's saying that all Scripture is breathed out. In other words, God has blown out to us. He has breathed out to us something that has taken life, the Word of God. And this is what he's telling Timothy. And we have to understand that the Greek language was a language that was used to communicate ideas. So when Paul is writing here, He's writing to Timothy as if I was trying to explain something to you. You go to my house, and we don't speak just English. We speak uh, Spanglish. Yeah. It's a mixture of English and Spanish, and we're jumping here, we're jump and our minds are working, and everything, because we're trying to communicate ideas that maybe I can't communicate them in English, but you're going to have to make sure you understand what I'm saying, so I'll communicate it in Spanish. And Paul is doing the same thing in the Greek. He's telling Timothy, look, it's inspired. It's breathed out. It's like if God came and he blew out, and as he blew, that word became life. So Timothy can get a better grasp of what Paul is saying. And when we see this, we are able to understand what he was trying to express here. Paul here wanted to express the idea and took the word God on one side and the word breathe on the other side and he combined them together and it says the word of God is God breathe. In other words, God breathe life into it. Now I want you to understand what I'm going to say the following here. When we understand that God's word has been breathed out, has been inspired, you know that's the same word that was used in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Isn't that amazing? What does it say? And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And he became what? A living soul. So he inspired, he breathed the word of God. So Paul is telling Timothy that the word of God is given by inspiration and in the Hebrew writer, or the Hebrew writer was able to communicate this in Hebrews 4 and 12 when he said, For the word of God is living and active. Listen to this. Paul's in a cell. He's telling Timothy, Look at the word. The word is inspired. The word is alive. And it reminds me of Paul's words when he said, Look, I may be in chains, but the word of God is not bound. You can't, you can't chain the word of God. You go to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., or the Bible Museum, and we have these sections and examples of all the Bibles that have been burned throughout all our history of, of mankind that they try to uh, eradicate the Word of God. But again, I go back to the Scripture that the man can try to do it, but the Word of God is not bound. It cannot be bound. It cannot be stopped. So now the Apostle uh, Peter verifies this. In 2 Peter, you go with me, chapter 1, verse 21. In the King James, 2 Peter 1, 21 says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The English Standard Version says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That word moved or carried along is the word in Greek for inspired. So in other words, that Greek verb for inspired suggests the idea of pushing. So when we see this here, in the classical Greek, it's used to describe a ship when it was raising its sails. And as it raised its sails, you know what happened? It caught wind. And the wind began to push the ship. The ship didn't move by itself. It was pushed. And Peter is telling us that these men of God were moved by the Holy Ghost. They were used, they were inspired by the Holy Ghost. What Peter is saying that the Bible was written under the impulse of God. It was the Holy Ghost who revealed the message, who constrained the writer to write it, who guarded the writer's hand and his mind as he began to write that he would only communicate the message of God and not his own message. That's the same thing today. I look at this scripture and I look at Christianity today 
And what is the problem that we have today in the pulpits? That men are preaching their ideas, their traditions, and their personal convictions, and not the inspired Word of God. It is said of the one of the main ministers of the West uh, Minister's Chapel in, uh, in England, uh, that this brother, when he was uh, appointed to be a pastor of that church in England, he had come to a church that had become a social gathering. They would move the pulpit and they would have all these dance programs and these dramas and these skits. And he was asked to pastor. And the first thing he did when he came to that local church, he said, Let's br bring me the pulpit. And he put it back in the middle and he grabbed the hammer and some nails and he began to hammer the pulpit. And he said, all right. He said, this church will stand and it will fall on the preaching of the word of God. We will not move this pulpit from here. What about the Reformation period? When the men preached the word of God in the corners, on the right or the left side. And as the Reformation began to take place, they said, let's bring the pulpit back to the middle. In other words, make the focus the word of God. The inspired word. Are we in the same situation in Christianity today? But there has to be a group of people that are willing to face the implications for our belief in the inerrancy of the Word of God. Peter is saying that the Bible was written under the impulse of God. It is profitable for doctrine, and it is profitable for increase. Now, I will finish with this. The inerrancy of Scripture is a fundamental doctrine that underlines our faith and guides our understanding of God's Word. The Bible is not merely a collection of human writings or opinions. When you read it, don't think about it that way, but rather, what you're reading is the inspired and authoritative Word of God. What you have in your hands today was because men gave their lives to translate the Bible in English so that you can read the Bible today. William Tyndale, one of these men who began the great task of translating the New Testament into English, gave his life, persecuted for what he did. And what we have in front of us today. Take advantage of the Word of God. Carry it with you everywhere you go, in school, at work, at lunch, in your car, in your house. Everywhere you go, do not let go of the Scriptures. Because if things continue to go the way they're going in our country, sooner or later we will not have that opportunity. And furthermore, the inerrancy of Scripture is not merely an abstract concept of theology, but it's the practical implications that we live our lives and make our decisions according to the Word of God. As we trust in the truth and the reliability of God's Word, we have confidence in the guidance that it provides and the promises that the Word of God makes. Remember what Isaiah once said, the grass withers, and the flowers fall. But the word of God endures forever. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Amen. This passage underscores the enduring and unchanging nature of God's word, which provides us an unshakable foundation for our faith and a guide for our lives. Get into the word. Amen. Get into the word of God. If you have to get a study Bible, go buy a study Bible. Get your children into the Word of God. Read to them the Scriptures daily. Oh, but they're not going to understand it. Well, get a, a translation that they can understand. There is no excuse today to establish ourselves in God's Word. Get into the Word. Oh, I can't read it. I don't know how to read. We'll go to YouTube. Listen to the Word of God on your way to work. Listen to the Word of God when you're at work, when you're at home, when you're washing the dishes. Let the Word of God sink in into your life. Yes. 
That's what we need. Not only us, that's what our country needs. This is what the world needs. It's the Word of God. And remember what we've learned in these two days, that it is reliable and that it is accurate. Not only historically, but that it is inspired by God. I want you to rise with us in this afternoon. Amen. Let's just thank the Lord for His Word. Amen. I, I believe that God has done great things already. But let's all just close our eyes and let's just thank God. Thank Him that we are in a country right now that we have the freedom to worship God. Thank Him for that. There's different places around the world at this moment that they're hiding just to do what you and I are doing. There's places right now where Christians are being in prison just for believing in what you and I believe in. And we have the privilege to be in a country that we are free to worship. But what if that freedom would be taken away tomorrow? What scriptures would we have in our hearts memorized? What would help us to continue on without the Bible in front of us? Is our faith strong enough to persevere in the midst of persecution? Think about it. I want you to close your eyes and let us pray. Lord, we.